Yes, shoot, go well, for it. Your, na- your name is Leon Gersing. Leon Gersing. Gers- uh, Leon Gersing, how are you doing? <laughs> Thank you. you. Software artisan for Edge Case. Edge Case. Um, and what are you doing for Edge Case? Um, right now, we're working with a very large customer using uh, Ruby uh, primarily to uh, do uh, integration testing for a very, very large uh, system that they're implementing. Okay. And I, I met you almost exactly a year ago today on the bus. <laughs> yes, the DevLink bus. And at that time, you were doing .NET development. Yeah. Um, and uh, I understand that you like Ruby a lot more than .NET. Okay, so let's let's first clarify terms. Okay. Right. So I prefer Ruby as a language to the prevalent languages on the .NET platform today. That's C Sharp and VB are the two. Correct. Languages, right? Now there are ancillary kind of peripheral languages that are gaining. Like Iron Ruby, for example. Like Iron Ruby is coming on all the DLR languages, Iron Python, F Sharp. So there are, and, and then of course there's the other ones that, you know, like manage C plus plus. But right. So yeah. So out of those, uh, those is Cobol dot Yeah, exactly. I don't know if there's a new version of that. Exactly. <laughs> I'm not interested. All right. But uh, but yeah. So so it's not a question of. Um, I went to C Ruby or the MRI version of Ruby because I don't like .NET. Okay. It was more, I didn't, I don't like those languages for building the software that I build. And I find for, for the 80-20, for me, Ruby is, all, is the better language for my needs. Okay, now, I don't have, I have very little Ruby experience. So mm-hmm. tell me what you mean by that. What, what's, uh, your, what are your needs and why are they meant better by Ruby than they are by C Sharp? Sure. So they're both um, object-oriented languages. I mean, they both um, follow similar patterns. They just do it in, in different ways, right? So um, not to give a whole class here on, on the differences between those types of languages, but um, they're both strongly typed languages, but um, one is also dynamically typed versus statically typed. What does that mean, dynamically typed? Okay, so uh, a statically typed language, um, its type is determined at compile time. Now I know uh, people are gonna be upset because they're right, now C Sharp 4 has your dynamic features. Let's talk about the current versions. So yeah, I'm, I'm going for those. C right? sharp three dot net three five. Exactly. One. Exactly. So um, there's an inherent limitation in the in some of the language features that aren't that doesn't exist in Ruby, right? Ruby's idioms um, are more flexible and expressive to me, to my eyes, um, and I can get a lot of the same tasks done in a fraction of the code. So that, excuse me, that's something I like. That's something that works for me. Okay. Uh, so Things like the, language the, features, the, for the instance. Definition: statically typed versus dynamically typed. Okay, so static typing is um, the the uh, type is assigned uh, at compile time, at okay. pre-compile time, right? So you you say um, like a string x equals foo, right? Right. So that's so statically typed. That's, that's a string. Going forward, er, the compiler always knows that's x a is a string. Right. Uh, whereas dynamic typing, we would just say x equals foo, or we would turn in x later. Um, it could be a string, we could reevaluate, it could be something else. Uh, it's dynamic, the type is assigned dynamically at runtime. It's assigned at the time that you assign a value to the variable. Exactly. Okay. But that can... And that can change at runtime. That can change at runtime. So, mm-hmm. so you can assign food well, to x, and later on you can assign 25 to x, will that change sure. the type? Yes, and that'll change the type. But once the type is set, it's strongly typed. Hmm. So once you have a type, you're, you're not... Uh, you, you're not divulging from that type. That type is actually that type. Okay. Why is that an advantage? Uh, you don't have to type string x. So it's one less word to type. So it's less typing, but yeah, it's less typing. But it also means that at runtime, those objects can be more alive. They have greater flexibility. We can determine what they are whenever we want to determine them. So primitive types are a little difficult to determine that, right? So that's okay. a, that's a bad example. All right. right. So. Uh, say classes, for instance, right? So, I mean, there are better examples of why it's a better language for, in my eyes, than another one. Oh, okay. So, so, let me, on that. so that's a pretty close one, right? So they're both, they both are strongly typed. So that's a pretty easy win, right? They're both there. Okay. Static versus dynamic typing. I see, the, I see the benefits from being, from using it, but that would be a pretty hard argument to sell. Other things that I do like are things like uh, the fact that Ruby supports open classes, right? So an no open definition. class, yeah, an open class would be a class that can be open and modified at runtime. Uh, that its definition is not really in stone at any point. Um, so I can 
if I want, um, take say, um, let's see, what's a good class? I can take any private, so it, I can take any class, open it, and change the implementation for a method inside of it. Okay, so I have a customer class. Mm -hmm. It has a method, uh, get last year's sales. Exactly. And if you use get last year's sales in the way you designed it in C Sharp, right? Let's say that inside that method, however your architecture is, you're calling out to some database, right? Okay. And I want to test that that method can be called and returns the value that I want. But I'm not testing that particular piece. Maybe I'm testing something that interacts with that piece, right? So in unit testing, we might build a mock for the customer, right? right. And have a fake, what was the method? Get address or something? Uh, get uh, customer sales. Get, yeah, get customer sales. So um, instead of going out to the database, I might want to have a mock that provides me just a fake list of expected return types from that method. Okay, right? just always returns $100,000. Exactly, something like that. So if uh, in C Sharp, when I do this, I will use a mocking framework that will basically, at like runtime, generate uh, a proxy class, which is like a is like another inherited version of that class, but it's not the class itself okay. uh, to, to perform that. It's jumping through a lot of hoops. Uh, and we'll get to uh, access modifiers in just a second. But um, in Ruby, instead of having that mock, because the class is open, I can literally open the, uh, open the class and change the method to just simply return whatever I want to return. Oh, I see. And I can do that in the context of my test and have a different context in the actual application. Okay. So, so one other thing I wanted to put out in, in to go with that is that mocking in .NET gets a lot of flack because of uh, things like private sealed access modifiers. So in C Sharp, there's the notion of an access modifier. So I can say, this is a private method. This yeah, is a... Exactly. Inside the class. Exactly. This is sealed. Like you, can't can't inherit, in, yeah, you can't inherit from it, that kind of thing. Um, in Ruby, we don't have those. And even if we, I mean, we do, we have private, public, and protected. Mm -hmm. But even those, because we can open the class and change them, we can actually just tell the method, hey, guess what? You're not private anymore. Now you're public. Wow. So that we can play with it. Um, it's more of a guideline than a rule. It, exactly, exactly. So yeah, exactly. That's exactly what we're doing. So as API designers in Ruby, we may say, these are private methods. We don't really expect that you'll need to use these methods. But because it's Ruby, we don't know any better than you. So if I write a library, I don't know your use case. And you may actually need to see something like that. Okay. And you have the opportunity to do it. I believe languages with stringent access modifiers and things that are trying to obfuscate the actual code that you're delivering on hurt the developer more than they help the developer. Interesting. And I believe that those languages tend to be a little more condescending in their delivery, I then trust something. the developer to absolutely. Do so I use the word the obfuscate uh, part of it. I, I would use the word abstraction. So okay, we're trying to abstract away the complexity. Uh, sure, and uh, allow the developer just to focus on the public interface. Sure, and that's really the advantage of doing it, of making things private. Yeah, you don't care about these. They they're part of the internal workings of it. We're going to encapsulate them inside this private mm -hmm. method. These are the important methods. Right, um, and nine times out of ten. That usually works out, okay. right? And uh, I would say the, the times that it was hardest for me to use C Sharp and those uh, in that when I needed to get under the guts a little okay. bit um, is when I was working for a company that did product. Right. And we didn't necessarily know every particular use case of a particular item, so I wanted to be able to dig a little deeper under the, that abstraction mm -hmm. to make sure that I was mocking out scenarios that I could expect. But since I couldn't do that, I had to jump through a lot of reflection hoops to right. maybe get to do it, and I wasted a lot of time. Whereas in Ruby, I could just do it. <laughs> I could just okay. rewrite something. So we have a lot of consternation about, uh, I remember when um, MVC was starting to get popular, ASP.NET MVC was starting to get popular. Sure, that's the popular is still going on. And right it's now. still going really great. Um, there was that talk about whether or not to make, uh, what was it, the HTTP context an interface versus a, an abstract base class. Hmm. And there were reasons why it shouldn't be one or the other, but the main run is that they were trying to protect the system. And that's totally fine. I understand what they're trying to do, but I don't want your protection. Hmm. And if I need to test something, I know better than you at some point. Yes, you wrote a great tool. Thank you very much. I like it. 
But sometimes I just want to get in there and make sure that I can use and craft my tools in a way that I'm free to use my imagination and I'm not hampered by the constraints of the language itself. So that's the big message here is that the Ruby gives you more control as a programmer over what you can do. Yeah. It just directly gives you that. It, and now you're an experienced developer. Do you think that is also true that, uh, say, a junior developer, do, don't they need that protection? Don't they need to no. kind of... No. no, I don't. I don't think that we should condescend to our developers at any level in the game. Uh, there are a lot of people that are doing a, a significant portion of the Ruby community is quite young. It's actually in the early 20s, mid 20s range. Uh, a lot of the great. Yeah, I, I'm early 30s now, I think, but thank you, flatter. So. Uh, <laughs> So, and these guys, sure, they might shoot themselves in the foot a few times, but you're telling me you can't shoot yourself in the foot in any language? Not me, but yeah, some people. Don't. I mean, some of you, yeah, you're a champ, yeah, so that's fine. But, <laughs> but, but yes, I, and I think that going through those processes will help you be a better programmer. Now, on the Ruby side, too, our culture is one that because we have these open classes, because we have message passing, because we have this openness, and I'll get into message passing if you like in a minute, sure. um, we encourage things like unit testing. Oh, unit testing would be more important it is Ruby than it is in .NET. Absolutely. It so is we don't have a compiler, right? So we're missing out on that compile time check that a lot of people really like. Right. And it is a great tool, right? So you misspell something or something's the sure. wrong that's, type. That's or, like a unit test. I mean, it's a nice little mini unit test, right? You get a little red bar that says you failed. Sure. <laughs> it's kind of the same it's, thing. It's strictly enforced. Right. Uh, unit test fills that purpose and a whole lot more. Okay. So if you are being a diligent craftsman and writing those tests, and they're very easy to write, they help uh, help ensure the, the the quality of your product. Mm -hmm. um, then you're going to find those those bottlenecks, those errors, those things where you shoot yourself in the foot pretty quickly. Okay. So uh, the uh, now that's true in .NET or Ruby that the unit testing is going to find these bottlenecks. Absolutely, so I would say. Testing. Yeah, unit tests work whenever you can in whatever language you can. Uh, but is that so? Is that an advantage that Ruby has then, because people are forced to use unit tests, or they're more encouraged to use unit tests? I mean, it's that, a or is just it's just a cultural it? idiom. I would say it's not. No one's forced to do anything. Right. But if you try to submit a patch without a unit test in in the Ruby world, it's going to be kicked back to you. Hmm, interesting. That's not true in the .NET world. You no open open source code. You submit a patch. No tests. Well, I don't want to say not true ever, <laughs> but uh, I, I do know a, a great number of .NET developers who are working on open source, I will not name names, who don't believe that the unit test is the end all be all. Sure. And that's okay. That's, and, and I would say too is that if your code coverage can't be 100%, if you, uh, there's a, I can't remember who asked uh, my boss, Joe O'Brien, uh, I can't remember who asked him this question, but basically put this put this to him and said, if you can write it in one line, I want to test it in one line. Mm -hmm. And that was a very interesting point. The idea being, I don't want to introduce additional complexity just to test something. And in C-sharp, there can be a significant overhead <coughs> of complexity that's added just to get out the same value that I get from a dynamic language. Sure, that's definitely true. Mocking is harder. It's, a, it's significantly harder, and there are lots of tools that are just pop up just to solve those problems. And I, I, I didn't want to struggle with those decisions. I'd rather write software. Okay, fair enough. Anything else? No, that's it. Use awesome. Ruby, and, and and I would say this: for like, this is not a platform fight, right? Like Ruby is. Uh, it isn't with me, and it shouldn't be with anyone. It really should. Ruby is a great language. It's very easy to learn and pick up. Uh, Edgecase actually does a self-learning uh, process called the Ruby Cones. You can get them; they're free on GitHub. That's my only uh, experience with Ruby is going through the Ruby Cones. That Joe and Jim and it's yeah, Jim Warwick and Joe O'Brien wrote these great things, and it's self-paced learning, so you can try it. Even if it works on Windows, works on uh, Mac, works on Linux. Um, so where can you find the cones? Uh, at GitHub. So just go to GitHub and search for uh, Cones. K O A N S. Okay. Uh, you'll find it, or search for Edgecase if that's easier to spell. Uh, <laughs> But um, yeah, and the, like the JVM has JRuby, and .NET now is having IronRuby, which right. is at point nine. And right when I just, I know when they get to one they're going to start working on performance and getting it up and really turning the screws. Sure. And I would encourage anyone, even if you're doing C sharp development, maybe look at IronRuby to do a little of that mocking for you, mm -hmm. because you'll have cross pollination between your uh, your C sharp CLR types and IronRuby. 
And you can use iRuby to actually unit test your C-sharp code with very little friction. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. So I did the uh, stuff for Gestalt, right? So there's a small lab project that came out of the Mix Labs called Gestalt. Okay. And what it was was being able to write Python and Ruby using Iron Ruby and Iron Python directly in the browser instead of using JavaScript to manipulate the DOM, hmm. uh, which was really cool. Yeah. But there was one thing they wanted me to do. They wanted me to create uh, like a snowflake thing, like an yeah. animated snowflake. Oh, the exactly. Um, and because I couldn't inherit from Ellipse, which is what I wanted to do to just basically graft the move functions on it, okay. um, I decided, wait a minute, I have Ruby. So I actually opened up the private sealed Ellipse class <laughs> and added the methods I needed and went on my merry way and it was no problem. I always thought if you did that, that people would show up at your door with black suits and sunglasses. They're still trying to find me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, where, where can you find Leon Brzee on the web? You can find me usually as Fallen Rogue. Uh, and you see this plaid hat, you'll know you've found me. Uh, but yeah, fallenrogue.com or twitter.com slash fallenrogue. Awesome. Leon, thank you so much. Thank really you, Dave. We learned a lot. Technology and friends make happy code. <laughs>